Um, no problem. <laughs> thank you. So Sunita is connecting from the United States. She's from the University of Delaware. She's an associate professor. And her talk is quite related to what we have just seen because it's on HPC and interdisciplinary research as the talk by Luca Cardelli, which, is, uh, at, which was addressing actually computing and life sciences, chemistry specifically. Uh, so Sunita, whenever you want, you can start sharing your screen. Okay. Um... Thank you. Go ahead and do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. I am getting there. Just a second. Okay. Do you see my screen now? Yes, we yes. do. Okay. Wonderful. So thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, yeah, I logged in a few minutes before Luca's talk ended and I wished I had logged in earlier. So thank you for that um, nice, you know, um, intro. Um, so yeah, so this talk is going to be uh, giving you ideas about three projects among uh, several others that we have going on in our group. And um, all the three projects are interdisciplinary science-based and different projects have given us um, different ideas of how to um, you know, be successful in an interdisciplinary science project where you have more than just um, a fundamental computer science, but you're trying to apply computer science to some real world applications. And there've been a number of challenges, solutions um, of how would you apply high performance computing, that's what HPC stands for, to interdisciplinary research. Um, right. So I think over the past four or five years, um, what we have gathered, um, you know, talking to the different scientists and everything, it's, it's really a challenge and it's hard to communicate, you know, computer science to non-computer scientists because we technically speak two different languages and um, it's, it's, it's a lot of effort to understand what the problem is, what the algorithm is, and uh, what is the science we are solving before we can wear our you know, computer science hat on and do the needful, right? So um, another need of why interdisciplinary science is important is there are tons and tons and tons of legacy code, just exactly how Luca was telling you guys about life science and uh, weather modeling or you know, plasma physics, biophysics, solar physics, those will be the three um, topics that we'll be uh, looking today. There are lots of legacy code that's been written 40, 50 years ago, you know, for computers that don't exist today. And those applications need to be moved to today's platform, tomorrow's platform, right? So, and, and these platforms are significantly different than just um, platforms that were 10 years ago. So how do we migrate legacy code um, written for serial computers because battle computers did not exist uh, for a long time so how do you move such code to tomorrow's you know, hardware platforms? And um, there is a dire need for these kind of you know, research software to enable scientific advancements. By that, I mean, when a computer scientists create software, we don't just create software, we create research software because at every time you try to you know, migrate a code or you try to parallelize a code, the, the fundamental thing that you're doing is to first understand the algorithm, right? You're first trying to understand um, what is the physics that is being solved? What is the problem that you're solving before you can create a suitable um, software for it? So there is a ton of research involved first. And um, in our group, we work with so many domain scientists that often, you know, to align and adjust I pause for a second and I ask them, why are we parallelizing this, right? What is the problem we are trying to solve? And by, um, by touching base on this question ever so often, you're trying to understand why should you do this parallelization? So this helps you keep motivated you know, about the science itself. And we try to understand um, you know, what is the strength and what is the value of the physics of the algorithm before we try to move the code to a, you know, another platform. Um, another very important uh, you know, uh, aspect is communication, that is sharing knowledge across scientists, which is key to success. 
So like I said, it, it again corroborates with the very first point where, you know, the computer scientists, we speak in terms of optimizations, in terms of programming models, in terms of compilers, you know, but the domain scientists tell you in terms of the solar atmosphere or the chromosphere, or they talk about plasma physics, or they talk about a plasma chamber. Um, so there are two different aspects, but unless we share information and ask a lot of questions, it is not you know, possible to do the right things um, when the code is super new to you. And the last point on the slide, I wanted to let you all know, um, and I hope you all have come across this particular concept called research software engineers by now. If not, please look it up. I just put a link to the US RSC, but the RSC um, a concept is not just a US based, it's across the globe. Um, there is one in Europe, there is one in, uh, I believe, Asia. Uh, so check RSC, uh, you will get a ton of links where the whole idea is this is a consortium where people like you, people like us, right? Research software engineers have created an, a nonprofit organization where they are coming together to discuss the problems, the challenges when domain scientists um, you know, have come up with these legacy code and these codes need to be moved to next you know, generation supercomputers. So if you haven't checked the RSC site, please do, because it gives you a, there's a newsletter, there is a way you can sign up and you can get more you know, input, there's a Twitter handle. Um, so it's a good way to stay engaged. Okay, the first story that I would like to tell you about is a solar physics and an HPC story. So here, I hope this video plays, uh, yes. So this is a project with um, NCAR, National Center for Atmospheric Research here in Denver, US, Max Planck Solar Society, which is in Germany, Lockheed Martin and University of Delaware. The, this project started three years ago. And what you see on the right-hand side, the video is basically the chromosphere. It's, it's a solar flare, you know, there's this colorful, um, the, the fire that's eruption, that's basically solar flare. And the idea of this project is that there is an NSF, multi-million dollar NSF telescope. When I say NSF, it is National Science Foundation sponsored telescope being um, uh, installed in Hawaii, which is the other picture that you see over here. And this telescope is collecting tons and tons and tons of data. Now, that's wonderful. But how do you process the data at a speed that the data, um, the generation of data and the processing can somehow sync up? Otherwise, you're going to land up with tons of data and you know, the processing time will be really long and then we'll be far behind, right? This other little piece of uh, picture, the piece of this is you know, yellow crystals. What you see is basically the first image the telescope picked up um, from the sun, basically. So this is very much work in progress. We, we are not involved in the part of the you know, data gathered um, space, but we as computer scientists in the University of Delaware work with NCAR and Max Planck Solar Society to accelerate the code called MURAM, which is Max Planck University of Chicago Radiative. MHD stands for Magneto Hydrodynamics Code, where the idea is we have a code that talks about the solar flare of the chromosphere layer, and we want to expedite it, accelerate it, run it faster, as much faster as we can on multi-core CPUs, multi, um, GPUs, multi-GPUs on large scale systems, right? So that's the motivation. And um, this is a project with one of my PhD students and one physicist from Max Planck Solar Society, um, two, two to three physicists from NCAR and two to three computer scientists from NCAR as well. And Lockheed Martin um, plays a consultant, plus, you know, they've been uh, working with us on the code itself. So as you can see, it's a large team. And my PhD student started off with um, basic parallel programming experience back in 2017. And uh, he has come a long way in the project, learning high performance computing, operating system, hardware architectures, compilers, uh, programming models, uh, GPU architecture, um, enough to get to this point that we um, have a fair idea of how the code is written. And we work with the physicist in Max Planck Solar Society who adjust the physics and the algorithm based on how fast we're able to run the code. But this doesn't mean that we immediately jump into optimizing and making the code better, right? We have gone back and forth, back and forth with the entire team for over a year to understand the serial version of the code as to what problem is it solving? What are the parallel patterns? 
how could we enable you know better uh, code restructuring depending on um, how far can we go with the acceleration and you see a programming model which is called OpenACC. If you have heard of OpenMP, um, OpenACC is quite similar. It's a directive-based programming model that can be used to target multi-core plus GPUs. And there are over 200 odd um, you know, scientific codes that's already been ported to OpenACC. Um, so if you go up, look up openacc.org, I think you will get a ton of materials. There is resources, there is self-learning, um, slides, recordings, GitHub, and everything. Um, so that, that's the programming model we basically used. So what were the findings, right? Um, we, we first had to understand the structure of the algorithm. Then we obviously encountered a ton of software and hardware bugs because the code has been uh, migrated to um, Max Planck Society machines, NCAR machines, UD machines. And in all these machines, you use different compilers, different, different compiler plus different compiler versions dependency packages. Um, so everything together has to come uh, you know, together for you to be able to target the kind of system um, where your code is running. And during the process, we also uh, uh, got into ambiguities in the OpenACC specification, which means um, OpenACC has this you know, uh, 200 or pages PDF where there is a definition of pragma ACC parallel. If there is a pragma ACC parallel, how is the compiler supposed to implement this pragma, right? Just like OpenMP, if you have used that. Um, however, the specification definitions are not set in stone. So sometimes there are um, you know, uh, places where the specification uh, could be adjusted, could be revisited, could be reevaluated, because we as implementers or application developers didn't quite follow the definition as it is written. So we go back to the specification developers and we tell them, hey, look, this definition needs to be revisited because we don't follow X, Y, Z. So that's what I mean by ambiguity. So that was also a wonderful opportunity to go back to the programming model features and redefine anything that was, um, you know, that was ambiguous. Then we ran into a ton of verification issues, obviously, because you first want to figure out if your serial code is running fine. And then you want to figure out if your multi-core version of the code is running okay. And then you want to figure out if the GPU version of the code is running okay, right? And we, um, I admit embarrassingly that we didn't have a wonderful setup for verification. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you in a little bit what we did to fix it um, because this is about um, you know, several thousands of lines of code. And as and when you make changes to the code, there is a lot of places where you could mess things up and that could eventually fail the execution and fail the um, output. So you do want a base reference output and compare all your versions of the code against the base um, value. And you need a setup to be able to do it because when there are six people working on the code, um, there is a lot of you know, um, uh, ways your entire setup can fall apart. And besides all this, of course, there are performance issues and there are tools that you can identify GPU register pressure, you can identify uh, what was a kernel overhead, you can identify communication issues between the several nodes if you're using MPI and so on. Um, so since 2017 till date, you can see it as four years, that we have gone ups and downs many times. We have missed paper deadlines. Um, we have missed project deadlines. We have missed presentation deadlines because of all these bugs and issues and things. It's a learning process. Uh, so what did we learn, right? The, again, remember that this is an interdisciplinary science project. You're talking to solar physicists. There are two different languages. So it takes numerous conversations to align what you are saying and what they are saying. So the things that I, we learned were make incremental changes. You know, don't get overexcited that you look like you look at this um, several thousands of lines of code in a single for loop, and you think that oh, I could do so many things to this for loop, and you do everything at once. Then it is very difficult to backtrack if you come across a com compilation or a runtime or a verification issue. So we did do this mistake because we got overexcited. Then we traced our steps back. We unrolled you know, several versions of GitHub and we tried to make incremental changes to track down the bugs. Then what we did not do was test after every commit. So the first two years, we did a very bad job in testing. 
we didn't have an infrastructure, we didn't have Jupyter Notebooks, so we committed and there were other people committing to it. And we tested against you know, a few, a few things, but we didn't test the whole setup itself. Uh, it was a mistake. So in the last two years, we have done a lot of fixes because we learned a lot of lessons. So test after every commit and documentation. I know, you know, if we all do a lot of coding, but we don't document because it's, um, oh, well, you know, I've got this working. You know, why should I document? Let me move on to the next piece of code. So that's the attitude but that is a mistake. So you want to document, and at the very least, you can look back at the documentation two years from now and feel happy about you know, how you wrote that particular structure of the code. So you, there are different tools you can use to document. Simple thing would be CC++, double hash, you know, uh, the, la the lines, and you comment it out, right? And then you write your comments, or you could use Doxygen. So there are many things you can you do to document the code appropriately. Then another thing we learned was, experimental setup, which means every time you use one vendor's compiler, say you use NVIDIA compiler, um, it works. That doesn't mean the code is going to work on another compiler, right? So you want to mix it up a little bit. So we used more than one compiler. We used both CPUs and GPUs. We used three different systems. And something else we found was the code verifying correctly for one data set size does not mean it is going to verify correctly for the other data set sizes. Because when you think about you know, uh, 50,000, 60,000 lines of code, domain decomposition, you have, you have six to seven types of data set, X, Y, Z directions. Um, and you want to test out more than one domain decomposition layout to ensure that the code is not failing for a different type of a data set size. Um, optimizations. Optimize only after you thoroughly verify the serial or the base version. If your serial version is shaky and you add a hyphen 03 or a hyphen 02 to your optimization, CPU optimization, it may fail, but maybe your serial code is failing on the first place, right? So you don't want that. Um, verification, build Jupyter notebooks. This is what we did systematically after failing to verify for a number of um, <laughs> several months. We missed a few paper deadlines and then we got our act together. And now we have built Jupyter Notebooks to capture and record divergence of results between different you know, versions of the uh, output. Then the results uh, where this is work in progress. We also, right now you see a Volta 100 GPU results, but we also have Ampere 100, um, NVIDIA Ampere 100 GPU results ongoing. Um, so that we got about 1.73x speed up um, over a fully subscribed 40 core Intel Skylake CPU node. You might wonder, huh, so three years of work for 1.73x speed up, what is that supposed to mean, right? But this is, don't forget, this is not a matrix multiplication or a Jacobi or a hello world, right? We are talking about a real world scientific code. And there are many kernels in this code that could benefit from acceleration. So this is a starting point and there is much more room to grow. So yeah, so we were successful and we submitted uh, a first paper to ACM Pass last December. It's accepted. It's, uh, we're waiting for the DOI and one of my student presented this at the PASC July 2021 um, conference. So that was my tweet. Um, on the night of submitting the paper with my student because we were genuinely excited because everything came together after three and a half years. But it's a process, right? Okay, so this is one of the three projects. The second project I wanna tell you about is biophysics. Um, and um, you see, you get fantastic pictures and images when you work with domain scientists because you get these you know, cool images which rotates. Um, so what is this project, right? This project is also interdisciplinary science, and this is with the Department of Chemistry in the University of Delaware. And here we will look into a nuclear magnetic resonance NMR tool, which is vital to structural biology and biochemistry, which basically measures chemical shifts in protein structures in our human body, okay? And this is important because depending on how the chemical shifts in our protein structures happen, there are drug discoveries that can be made. Um, so it's important to find out, you know, uh, it all to predict these chemical shifts. Uh, what you see there, the image that is rotating is basically an HIV virus capsule. 
um, the the uh, the visualization and the creation of this image is by the collaborator Juan Peria from the Department of Chemistry, and uh, they do this as part of their research project. You know, so there are tools that could give you these beautiful images, and there's obviously a ton of work behind before you can generate such a cool image. Um, our job as computer scientists was to help Juan and his group to accelerate the prediction of chemical shift. Um, we were a group of two undergrad students from computer science department um, who had no uh, background on parallel programming. And this again, um, back in 2017. So for, they took my parallel programming course and for a, for, a, for a semester, they learned about parallel programming. And then another semester was about cleaning up the serial code. So this is a takeaway point here, right? When you're working on a large scale application, which has never been parallelized, which has never been accelerated on a GPU, the code is practically written for a serial computer. It is not written for a multi-core or a GPU platform, right? The code is written for the physics, for the algorithm. The code is not written for the hardware platform or the supercomputers that we have access to. So there are two fundamentally different um, ideas. So the very first thing we did was to look up the serial code and to try and clean the serial code and figure out how can we first, you know, make the serial code better. Let's start there before we even try to parallelize. So on that account, we spent a semester um, and this was a code from Ohio State University. Um, again, a code never been parallelized, never been accelerated, open source code. Uh, for the uh, chemical shift of protein structures, right? This was to determine um, the problem. So we cleaned it up and then I'll show you in a little bit uh, what was the effect of cleanup of a serial code. And then they took about a year to parallelize the serial code and then another semester to clean up the, uh, the parallel code and do some reprofiling and readjustment of the parallelization and activation. Then about a semester long to write the manuscript and then we finally published. And these two undergraduate students were supported by one of my PhD students and another PhD student from chemistry. So I would say that the first semester was spent in understanding each other, which was hard because um, the chemist is telling us about proteins and we are talking about GPUs. So there is a huge gap <laughs> and it takes a, a lot of time before the gap is somewhat bridged uh, it is never fully bridged. That is the art of interdisciplinary science. But as far as you can speak the other person's or understand the other person's language, we can make progress. So this was a team of two undergrad, uh, two PhD students, Juan Peria and myself. And these undergrad students so much loved the experience, they came back and joined my group as PhD students. So I'm grateful that they thought this was, uh, there is more potential to having learned um, parallel programming and all this cool stuff. So here, um, I'm also taking this um, opportunity to uh, uh, to let you guys know about the tools. So here we have, um, you know, look at the last bullet where we have uh, some tools which are called NVProf, Insight Compute, Insight Systems, Tools Analysis Utilities, is Tau, uh, Scorpi, GProf, Liquid. So these are performance plus profile profiler tools that can help you. Um, dig into the code and try to understand what's happening inside this large piece of code. Uh, what you see on the right hand side is a pie chart created out of uh, measurements we got from GProf basically, which is a GNU compiler uh, profiler. Um, and this is a serial code profiling. Um, then we also obtained large overview without needing to read. Yeah, so basically what we're seeing in that pies are different. Uh, pieces of the code taking different time, right? So all these are percentage of time consumed by the different pieces. Then there is also a piece where you can't do much by parallelization and acceleration, which is the file IO, um, input output, there is data reading, data writing. So that's the, that we didn't do much with that particular pie per se, but this pie and the different pieces of the pie gave us which portions we should focus on first. But guess what? This particular pie get select of 23%. I don't think my mouse is moving, but the little green pie, right? 23% was a serial um, piece of a code, which we could totally clean up. 
So just by looking at that kernel, which was taking so much amount of time and cleaning it up, made that pie vanish. And then the, all the different pies in the chart got adjusted. So we didn't even parallelize this particular get select function, but we just collapsed it into either the rest of the piece. For example, imagine you have a for loop and you're trying to call a function within a for loop X number of times when you could easily hoist that function outside the for loop because it doesn't need to run those 100 iterations. As simple as that, right? And this is what involved a lot of conversations with the chemists to try and understand how is the protein structures, how is the chemical shift really happening? And then you identify that, huh, this function doesn't need to be called 100 times, it just needs to be called one time. So why, what is it doing inside the for loop, right? So those kind of philosophies helped us remove the get select. And uh, here are some numbers. So this is again using OpenACC and um, you know, the, the, the top row to gives you the different data set sizes. The left-hand side is a serial unoptimized, optimized, the platform setup, NVIDIA Pascal 40, NVIDIA V100. So the bottom line here is, if you look at the last column with 11.3 million atoms, a serial unoptimized, which means the very first version we got from Ohio State was taking 14 hours to determine the, the, the chemical shift um, of protein structures. And after all the process of about two years of work by undergraduate students who are totally new to parallel programming, we got this down to 47 seconds. Now this 47 seconds could be brought down even further if we spend some time on the IO, the data in uh, read and writing part. But look at that massive difference, right? 14 hours to 47 seconds. And there are these intermediate steps as well. And just by cleaning up the unoptimized code, look at that, right? 14 hours to only so much. And then the several steps, and this is multi-core, this is 146 seconds. So um, another, another takeaway point here is computer scientists, we tend to compare um, multi-core versus a GPU, which means if you take a single node and that single node has 16 cores, I would compare 16 cores versus the GPU on the node. But often the scientists would like to see the performance improvement versus one core, which is why I have this uh, number here, right? So 14 hours is a serial core, and this is the GPU and this is the multi-core. So different people want different um, uh, ways of you know, evaluating their core. And this is also published in PLOS Computational Biology. And um, since the, we worked with those uh, chemists, they created this very beautiful a figure which also made it to the cover page of, I believe, May or July edition of uh, 2021 of PLOS Computational Biology, perks of working with interdisciplinary scientists. These are other images that they gave us. Um, this is the one that was rotating earlier on. And these are the different um, atom sizes. For example, 11.3 million atoms is this big tube that you see, right? And this particular thing is a single uh, structure, basically. Um, the last story I have for you is a plasma physics story. And here, what I would like you to do is, I hope, uh -oh, can I? I can't play this, can I? Shoot. No, okay, apologies. Um, so basically what we are, I uh, thought this is a, I thought I put a video. So what you're seeing is basically a plasma chamber. Um, and the video was supposed to show you how a laser pulse is tearing through this blue plasma chamber, displacing electrons and how there are negative and um, positive charged particles uh, being able to create this high electron volt energy. And this is what the plasma physics code is all about. And um, this is a project that we are, you know, working with uh, HCDR, Helmholtz Zentrum, uh, Dresden Rosendorf in Germany, and University of Delaware and Oak Ridge National Lab in the US. Now, the goal of this project is that in the US and Oak Ridge National Lab, which is in Tennessee, right now there is a system called Summit, which is the second fastest supercomputer in the world. The first fastest supercomputer in the world is in Japan, Fugaku, right? Um, Oak Ridge National Lab is building the first exascale system called Frontier, which is your image on the right hand side. Now, the goal of this plasma physics project is to move the plasma physics code, which is called PCON GPU, 
PIC stands for Particle in Cell on GPU. So this is again a beautiful, you know, a uh, 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 turquoise greenish image, um, aqua green image that we got from the visualization team of PIC on GPU, where the goal here is how much ever fast it ran on Summit, we have to make the code run 4x faster on Frontier. Now, Summit is IBM Power9 and um, NVIDIA Volt 100 GPUs. AMD, uh, Frontier is going to be AMD Epic CPUs and AMD Radeon Instinct GPUs. Two different system, two different setup, two different types of node. So it is a challenge to migrate this plasma physics code to the first exascale system ever. So this is a project that started off in 2019 and this is with uh, over 26, um, and at the bottom, in the, in, the, in the last row, you see the different collaborators that we are working with. Um, this is a team size of 26 members, most of them in Germany, my PhD student in the US, and the several vendors from AMD, Cray, as well as uh, Oak Ridge National Lab support, where our liaison is. We have time zone issues to start with, Europe time zone. Um, but, you know, among the 26 members, I guess 60 to 70 percent of them are physicists, plasma physicists. Again, tons and tons and tons of phone calls, meetings to try and figure out, you know, what is the problem they're trying to solve. And I wish that image played because I typically take the audience um, in the video where, you know, I take you to through a beach and you're sitting on a beach and you see this boat cruising through the water and that water is your plasma channel and the boat is your laser pulse. And then you have these, uh, you know, people who are the, uh, the surfers jumping onto those waves, which is being created because this boat is cruising through. And these surfers are basically your positive, negative charged uh, particles for creating that energy. So that's what I would have walked you through that video of how it played, my apologies. Um, but with that analogy, I was able to pictureize that up. Ah, so there is a gas chamber and there is a laser pulse and there is high electron energy being created because of how, how fast the laser pulse is staring through the plasma chamber. Just exactly how this boat is cruising through the waves, right? Creating those ripple effects. Um, so trying to understand with analogies have always helped um, to you know, corroborate what is the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, and again, it takes, uh, it takes numerous back and forth because different case studies can give you different numbers, different execution time, different speed up. But the question is, where do we want to get to, right? In our case, we wanted to get to the creation of a high electron tera voltage via this plasma physics and frontier and exascale and things. Um, this is also helpful to cure, um, to, to have a better chemotherapy in cancer treatments. In, and you can avoid with, the, with, the, with that sharp laser pulse, with that high electron, tera electron energy volt, you could avoid killing healthy cells when you're trying to attack the uh, cancerous cells. So the application and the impact of doing the science is a lot, right? Um, the third, second bullet tells you about the different moving parts. On the software side, we have Alpaca, which is a C++ abstraction layer. It is open source, so feel free to take a look. Um, there is OpenMP port, there is OpenACC port, there is Open, OpenPMD software uh, dependency package. And on the hardware side, the Exascale Frontier system today is being built. We have not used Frontier just yet. We are using pre-Exascale, pre-pre-Exascale, baby Frontiers. So we don't even know how the code is going to behave on Frontier, which may exist at the end of the year. So work in progress and the target is end of 2021. So we are trying to use a little system that mimics Frontier, but now we have to create science cases that can benefit from a beast like Frontier, right? So there is a lot of um, prediction. There is a lot of experiments, simulations happening along the site with, in the event that are, or in the, in the situation when we will have the real system, how, how, how are we going to move our code? to Frontier. So different benchmarking, different test code and stuff is what we're doing right now. And as you can imagine, the software compilers are all moving targets. Um, compilers are being uh, you know, uh, uh, worked on, enhanced and improved as we speak. Uh, features are being implemented and we are literally the guinea pigs um, to try out you know, how these different compilers are going to behave for different applications. 
Um, this code is also a CAR code. CAR stands for C-A-A-R, Center for Application Accelerated Readiness, where Oak Ridge chose eight CAR teams across the United States um, to basically test out Frontier before Frontier is made available to the entire world. Um, so we are one of those teams, which means we get to work very closely with the compiler and dependency packages and all the vendors and give them tons of bugs. So we irritate them a lot because we file a ton of tickets um, which needs to be fixed um, before we can get the core to a working uh, situation. Um, so there is, there, is, there is computer scientist effort, there are science cases being generated, there are tools that are moving targets, a work in progress, there are compilers that are, evalu that are you know, evolving as we speak and so on. Um, so by late 2021, there is a machine going to be ready and we're gonna target that first exascale system ever. Um, so there is bugs being reported, code migration to continue with workarounds, and still we need to make sure that we don't break the science, right? So which means verification is key. So, so far, what's been working for us, it's, we've been two years under the project, uh, maintaining GitLab ardently because we want to make sure that, you know, uh, that if somebody is submitting a code, uh, a PR request, somebody is approving it, you can't submit a PR and you can't approve your PR yourself, right? That's, that's, that's common sense. So we have all those going on and we have a Slack communication channel. Um, we share Google Slides and if you want to build a slide deck to give a presentation somewhere. Um, so yeah, so it's a, it's a large team of over 26 members hands-on and there are the vendors you know, sitting outside the 26 member team um, in order to be able to help us uh, cross the bridge. So knowledge, knowledge sharing again is key and breaking the big code base into different case studies have helped us a lot where you might have heard the terminology mini applications or mini apps, um, which are a condensed form of the large application, yet you want to make sure that you don't, um, you capture the physics of the application almost accurately in a mini application, right? Uh, because it's easier to work with a smaller case study than the whole application itself. You don't want to wait for hours before you can test one feature of a compiler. So you want to test little benchmarks. You want to break down the code into several smaller pieces. So test speed and benchmarking um, for per performance and so on. This is my last slide. Um, so what did we take away out of these several uh, challenges with interdisciplinary science out of these three case studies? Communicating science in an effective manner. Um, this, there, is, there is no golden rule. Um, it's, it just, go, it just you know, trickles down to how both parties, both domain scientists and computer scientists can effectively talk to each other, explain to each other in layman terms how a, a science is, uh, how computer scientists work, how the domain scientists work, how the course, um, the code is um, you know, created. Systematic testing. There's this, uh, this one thing I can insist to all you folks, systematic testing has helped us immensely in all the three projects to make sure that we might have beautiful speed up, but we might have a buggy code. So you want to be able to test along the way systematically to get to a phase that you have good performance, but you have not compromised on the, on the, on the verification. Um, and you want to report bugs and issues. Uh, one of my students, uh, she worked on a, a bunch of a benchmark suite and she used to go about creating workarounds. And then we figured that workaround is fine, but you also need to report bugs, right? So then she figured that that was a very important thing to do and she started to report bugs. And then by that way, we have been able to catch, um, you know, several issues on compilers and the compiler versions over a period of time has improved. So you may create a workaround to get over that phase of being stuck, but you're not helping the next scientist by creating a workaround. If you want to help the next person, you want to report the bug. You want the compiler vendors and software vendors to fix the bug in their next compiler release. And when they do that, they will ask you for a reproducer, right? You can't say, I got a 777 error. They're going to turn around and ask you, what is the error? Do you have a small code that gives you the exact error? because oftentimes you can't share the code you're working on. Solar physics code has a different license. We can't just share it to, um, you know, uh, Cray or AMD or NVIDIA because we ran into a bug. There are licensing issues. So you might need to create a small reproducer. Documentation, pretty please. 
documentation is very, very important. And if you want to look back at your uh, GitHub commits 10 years from now and laugh about it and have uh, you know these, these wonderful, happy moments about it, document today. So you can look back and be proud of the kind of restructuring and coding you have done when somebody else looks at your code or you go back and look at your code years from now. Um, and when you have like, you know, 1 million lines of code, you want to think about creating a mini application because then you, you, the turnaround time is fast and you can report bugs easier. You can figure out if something is working or not in a shorter span of time than waiting for your entire code to finish running uh, because it might take hours. And you want to set small goals because the three projects that I showed you, um, we are in third year, fourth year of the project, right? So when we started off, we wanted to solve the world. Obviously you can't solve the world in two years. So we then we took a step back and we set small, small goals and working with students, you want them to have um, aha moments quite often, right? You don't want them to wait for five years before you have the aha moment. So I like to see the students feeling very excited because they got an output or they got, a, they got a result. And how do you make that happen? You, make, you, you set intermediate goals. Little happiness can keep you motivated, can keep you excited, can keep you enthusiastic to get to your final goal. So find, a, how, find out how you can make the problem small. Try to solve in, in pieces, not the you know, whole code itself, more communication. I think I have insisted on that point quite a bit. Um, so that's pretty much my last slide. And on the right-hand side is a, is, a, is a picture before COVID times when we were all in our lab, you know, trying to get things done. So that's a picture from my group. So yeah, so that's what I got. And uh, let me go back to Zoom. Um, all right. Thank you very much for... Um, Listening. Thank you very much, Sunita. It was a, a great presentation, very complete, and the, the cases that you presented were very interesting, the, the three of them. Uh, we have received one question on the chat by Ye. Um, so his microphone is not working, so I'm going to read his question. He's saying, for multi-user development process, we used version control software such as GitHub. However, I am sure you're running many projects or experiments parallel in your university. And in practicality, we have to use different programming languages in a project and actually even tracing, debugging, updating, code cleaning with GitHub. GitLab is still very neat. Uh, is still, we need several days to follow up. Sometimes it is really hard and uh, yeah. Could you please share any good idea to manage projects or experiments, especially for relating to programming language development projects? Mm -hmm. So he's yeah. uh, a PS now uh, here, and he's saying that he writes note.txt files for each experimental project, and that's mm -hmm. a good way to recheck. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. This is an excellent question. And uh, we have, uh, um, I think we, we, ran, we ran into a very similar problem with um, um, another project where we, have, we are working on a benchmark suite uh, with about 15 codes, um, about uh, eight to different, eight to nine platforms and uh, different compilers and different um, packages. So, one way we are managing on that project, and I, I don't, I can't say it is the most efficient way, but it's working, is um, per system, we have created a uh, folder in GitHub. And in the folder, we put the config files um, and we use, use make files, config files. Um, so, you know, for one system, um, you list down the programming models or the compilers optimization flags, basically create a make file and, but, and, and create a config file. So every time you have to redo something, you're not you know, directly using command line, but you're going through these um, you know, scripts, uh, which you can update time and again. Um, at the same time, yes, that project also uses uh, two different compilers. Uh, like I said, it uses um, uh, 15 different codes and um, eight to nine different platforms. So it was un unmanageable, 
and we also use uh, different workload sizes. So we did create an Excel where uh, we had columns for uh, workload sizes. We created you know, uh, one sheet for one compiler, for example, and captured all the execution times for all the 15 codes for all the, the workload sizes. And we maintained several sheets for one platform. Um, but what has helped us the most, and there are and there are eight to nine testers, individuals, right? So what helped us the most was go to GitHub, create one folder per platform, and share all the config files um, together in one place. Um, so yeah, this this is a pain, um, but um, I think GitHub is your friend, um, and it may not happen overnight. You may need to wait for somebody else to fix something. So there is a you know round robin process. But um, GitHub is the way to go. In, instead of your note.txt, I think we do an Excel. So, um, which means you, you can help maintain um, the different compilers run on one single system in one Excel sheet. And you have captured all the execution times and stuff on that um, uh, one Excel sheet. And this is also my uh, recommendation to my students. When they come up and say, hey, I got 2x speed up, I asked them 20 questions. In the sense, 2x, 2x speed up on what machine, right? How many cores? Who's, who's a vendor? Uh, what compiler did you use? What version did you use? Is it documented somewhere? So, so then they use an Excel sheet and on top, you put all these details first. Before you create any plot, capture the experimental setup. Um, in papers and publications, in my, my this particular talk, it's not a good example because I showed you results directly, but if I were to give you a talk just on solar physics, I would have had a slide on experimental setup. Thorough details of what is your hardware and what is your software setup. Before that, don't get into the results. Um, this is a common practice uh, that, you know, try to bring within the group, um, but yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. Slack, we use Slack intensely for most of the projects. You're most welcome. Thank you. Is there any other question? Um, if it's okay, I'd like to ask a question. Absolutely. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so it's, uh, this is actually like, I, I love this topic. It's something that I, I work with um, domain science a lot in sort of trying to speed up things. Um, and at the risk of putting myself out of a job, I've often wondered if there's like an underlying issue, like maybe the main scientist not being trained properly in HPC, or maybe we're not making the right abstraction layers available. So I'm curious, what is your view on how do we make performance in domain science more sustainable? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, that's that's an excellent question. Um, it's hard, definitely very hard. Um, this is why I guess the research software, the RSC uh, people exist, where they're not just engineers. Often computer scientists are perceived as, oh, can you code this for me? Initially, I used to say yes, but now I say no, because you have to tell me what I'm coding for. You have to give me what is the science I'm coding for, right? Um, but yes, the domain, it's, it's, it's a, how do I put it? It's, I think the domain scientists look at us, computer scientists, to help them get better performance for their code. But what we do as part of all the three projects is, I don't just go apply a GPU optimization and move on. Any performance optimizations I have done in my code, I make sure to drag them in and tell them why I did what I did. And you would, you would uh, the biophysics code, right? There was this PhD student from chemistry. After working with us for three years, because we involved him in all our meetings, we involved him in all our optimization stages, he is able to take a kernel in another biophysics code and add OpenACC pragmas to it. That's a success. It wouldn't happen if we just went off to our corner and we improved performance and gave them a speed up, right? The two types of domain scientists as well. One type says, oh, just show me how you got this. The other folks want to get you, want to get to the details. So I think you want to insist to them that show them how you got the performance and don't just give them speed up, even if they don't care for how you got the performance. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Stephen. Um, oh, hi, Edward. I see a question. Uh, no need to. Okay, so it's a little bit strange, strange, of course. Uh, yeah, so for this, we have used definitely uh, for GPUs, NVIDIA compute um, and NSIGHT compute, NSIGHT systems. 
Um, lately, uh, the liquid, L-I-K-W-I-B, um, they have very nice documentation. I'm new to this tool, but um, apparently this works on multi-core systems, A64FX processes like Fugaku. Um, so performance tools analysis, basically. I haven't used it, but uh, this was like last month. They have YouTube videos, presentations and things. I would recommend that. Um, Gprof, you know, classic Gprof. You could start from there. You will get a mundane table with um, uh, execution times, but hey, that still, that still works. We have also used TAU, Tools Analysis Utilities, T-A-U. Um, we have used Scorpi and Vampyr. Scorpi and Vampyr are European-based tools and they have awesome support, um, IT support. Vampyr, I believe, is a visualization tool of Scorpi um, numbers, Scorpi evaluation. So it gives you communication overheads between NPI nodes. Um, and I think it also gives you per kernel um, um, performance analysis and things. Um, oh, shoot, <laughs> not yet, but uh, guess what? I teach it this semester. Um, I'll, 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 I'll see if I can uh, publicize my materials. Drop me an email, please. And um, I'll see what I can do because it's such an evolving course. Um, uh, you know, I keep updating it every time I teach because there's so many new things you can tell. 